evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December 2nd, uh, 2015 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Uh, I would ask everyone to call, uh, come to order, and if you would rise and the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowland? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Siazzo? Here. And Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, the council uh, had a very interesting afternoon. Uh, uh, we spent uh, from 3 o'clock till a few minutes ago uh, in a retreat, uh, team building uh, for myself, uh, and I'm sure other councilors will comment on it uh, from their own experience. It was very constructive, uh, very positive, and I think sets a, a, a very good tone for the start of our year. Um, we would like to have general public comments at this time, so anyone who would like to make a statement, please feel free to uh, approach the podium. See none. Close public comment. Uh, minutes of November 18, 2015, regular meeting. So it's moved. your pleasure. Second. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, any Comments or corrections? Uh, seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Adjustments to the agenda. I don't believe there are any adjustments to the yeah. agenda requested. Uh, items to be signed uh, uh, would be the treasurer's warrants, and they will be signed uh, later in the evening. Uh, our first order of business is order number 15093, 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for an innkeeper's license and a food handler's uh, license from Portland Hospitality, LLC, DBA, Candlewood Suites, Portland, located at 700 uh, Roundwood Drive. Uh, public comment is in order at this time. Is there anyone who would like to address the council on this matter? Uh, seeing none, uh, close the public comment and action on this item. Move approval of order number 15-093. Seconded. Uh, discussion? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, moving to old business, uh, we have three orders that uh, relate to each other. Uh, this is a second reading on these items. Uh, order number 15-084, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance to establish a new section, Roman numeral 16B, Higgins Beach Character Based Zoning Districts and Building Standards. Order number 15-085, second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to delineate the Higgins Beach character districts. And order number 15-086, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405C, the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance to address the development coverage allowance in the Higgins Beach area. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, town uh, planning director to address us on this to give both the council and our audience an update. Uh, thank you, Chairman Donovan and, and town councilors. I, I know that the council is very familiar at this point with the overall proposal. Um, I've done probably more presentations than you than want on it. So, um, in terms of tonight's update, I just want to kind of highlight a few adjustments that have been made since your first reading and public hearing. Um, we've used the council first reading public hearing and planning board public hearing process to continue to get input and refinements. Um, <coughs> think about refinements for the, the code. So it's been pretty productive in, in that regard and we've gotten some additional uh, input. And so we've 
continue to refine things to, to try to uh, dial it in perfectly for Higgins speech. Um, so in your packages, you should also you should have the original version that you passed at first reading, but also a memo and uh, an updated version dated November 24th that I'd recommend you consider for an amendment. Um, most of the changes that are in the November 24th version are <coughs> clarifications, there are uh, adjustments, improvements in interpretation, and also improvements in how it's, the code is coordinated with other jurisdictions, being the DEP regulations or shoreland zoning. So most of it's not substantive, really, it's improvements. Um, and then the other adjustments are, are pretty modest changes. Um, we've gotten some good feedback on typical um, or recommended kind of building depth. The recommendation of building depth should be 38 feet instead of 36, so be more flexible with interior floor plans, you know, house plans. So that's being recommended. It's a modest change. Um, we've gotten some good feedback on roof pitches for dormers, so we made some adjustments in that regard based on um, designers who work at Higgins Beach often. And we've identified a few things that kind of missed in an earlier version. We wanted to make sure stairs coming down from porches are allowed to encroach on setbacks, similar to a few other things, um, to, to make sure that people can get in their houses uh, reasonably. So, um, and lastly, we've made a change around the, the four mixed-use or commercial uh, properties. There's been kind of questions about what happens, say, uh, uh, commercial use changes to another commercial use. Is that reviewed by just staff or is that reviewed by the planning board? Um, typically, it would be reviewed by the planning board, and so we've made it clear in the code, given the <coughs> residential nature of Higgins Beach, that um, all changes of use um, for commercial property should be reviewed by the planning board under the site plan review ordinance, where they can look at um, changes and if there are impacts and what those kind of changes mean to the neighborhood. So. Um, that's the other kind of key change that's presented to you tonight that wasn't in the earlier version. It's just a clarification that all changes of use um, for commercial sites would, would go to the planning board for site plan review. Um, there are a few other changes folks have been interested in um, that we aren't proposing at this point because they're more than we're really able to deal with at this point, um, at, at this sort of stage in the review process and um, one of which is kind of looking at where rear additions go behind houses, can they slide next to property lines or not. And our recommendation at this point is given where we are is that we try the code for a year and that change be kind of on the list of do we need to make it in the future or is, it, is the code working well without making it. And I think that we've been talking about internally, this is um, a unique enough um, zoning district that we want to be looking at it a year from now anyway to make sure it's it's doing the things we intended and my guess is you know we'll come back to the council with some tweaks here and there um, to, to make sure it's to learn from experience and make sure it's working for the Higgins Beach communities so I just wanted to highlight that we have a handful of modest changes the ones that are more than modest we felt that we really shouldn't make at this point without going back out to the neighborhood and, you know, having a larger discussion. So um, that's what I have for an um, update in terms of the first order. The other two orders, one's the zoning map and the other is the shoreland zoning changes. There's no proposed adjustments to that. Those are as you uh, recommended as you reviewed them at first reading and as you discussed them at public hearing. So um, that's what I have at this point and happy to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions for Mr. Bacon? I do. Do to make a motion? We will. We have a motion, right? In, in, in a moment. Yeah. She has a question for Dan. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, I, it doesn't. I, it's. It's not necessarily directed towards Higgins Beach, but I think, and I'm sure everyone will know who I'm speaking of. But two weeks ago, when we first discussed this. I was always under the impression that this was something that we were taking Higgins Beach first as this model because Higgins Beach was the one that was really in the need for it immediately, um, these types of standards, and then we were going to kind of go on down the list 
of our beach areas because each beach area is so drastically different. Mm -hmm. um, I got a phone call late this morning with a concern of someone saying, so if this passes through with Higgins, is this automatically going to be next implemented um, at Pine Point? Is that where we're heading in that direction next? And <coughs> I'm, really so <coughs> I'm really sorry. <coughs> I originally would have answered yes because that was the impression that I was under from our first meeting. I, th I thought it was actually a positive thing that we were moving in that direction. Now I'm sort of kind of wondering if, if that's not quite such a positive thing. And how, um, after this passes through, what's our, wh what is our next step following up with that? Beach, I just want to be able to make a clear, uh, go back to them with a clear understanding before I move forward with Higgins. I think the, the intention is to, um, have some discussion with the residents of Pine Point to talk about just this zoning concept okay. to see and to, and to investigate Pine Point more to see if, if there are a lot of the same challenges in Pine Point as Higgins Beach. Higgins Beach is very unique mm -hmm. and is not just like Pine Point and not just like Prout's Neck. I mean, right. Higgins Beach has um, the vast majority of the lots are 50 by 100. They're very typical. It's a grid layout. It's it's different than Pine Point. So I don't think there's any intention of taking this code and trying to apply it to Pine Point. Um, I think there's the idea of taking this type of approach and applying it to Pine Point if Pine Point, after discussion, is interested in, in using this approach. Um, so this, the council passing this tonight, I don't think it would make a lot of sense to try to apply it to Pine Point, but we can think about what's the right outreach process with right. Pine Point to consider if a similar process occur next summer, um, but coming up with Pine Point's own set of standards because it's unique in its own right. Yeah, and I would just ask that if there is anybody out from the Higgins Beach area that I know so far everyone we've heard from has had a wonderful positive experience with this whole process. I haven't heard one negative thing about it. Um, I know that there was a couple of people from Pine Point that were interested in possibly sitting down with them and just maybe hearing from outside of, um, of the town's perspective, sure. maybe um, a citizen's perspective. Um, so if there is anyone that is, would be willing to meet with them, um, I'd be interested. <coughs> Putting those, putting those people together and letting them kind of do their thing. So, That's good, yeah. but thank you, Dan. Yep. I appreciate it. Uh, Dan, uh, yep. is it your expectation that the same sort of uh, exploratory meetings with the neighborhood would be scheduled uh, with Pine Point, uh, uh, as was the case with Higgins Beach? I think it's a good idea for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the initiate the initiation around this process was to talk to the Higgins Beach Association and some of the um, folks who've had challenges at Higgins Beach so we could, I think the same approach could be applied at Pine Point. That would make sense to to understand um, where people are at and, and, and also to try to explain this approach. It's unique. It's not typical zoning, so I can understand some reluctance around it without, you know, really um, getting under the hood and kind of looking at and understanding it. So. Thank you. Uh, public comment, uh, and then we'll take a, uh, a motion. Sorry, just a quick Chris, question. Yes, Sorry. Thank you. Um, Dan, you, you said um, a, a commercial reuse is going to go in front of the planning board, but mm -hmm. that's the only issue that's going to go in front of the full planning board. Everything else is still under administrative review. Is that correct? Correct. <coughs> thank you. And uh, the one change in the mixed-use zone, the commercial zone, I reviewed uh, those changes with both the uh, Breakers Inn and the Higgins Beach Inn uh, proprietors so as to make sure that they were aware of it, what the intention was, uh, and they felt a degree of satisfaction, and, and there was a comfort level with that process, okay. that site plan review process before the planning board for a change of use. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, public comment. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to be able to speak to this issue? Uh, seeing none and realizing we've been reviewing this for quite some time, it does not surprise me. 
that we had no uh, public comment, but uh, close and uh, pleasure of the council. Move approval. Do you want move approval of all three of them? Uh, I think at we will, uh, <laughs> one at a time. because we have an amendment <laughs> contemplated, right. uh, I would ask that if uh, we could have a motion concerning order 15-084 in the first instance. Move approval. Second. Uh, deliberation. Comments? Councillor um, uh, Caterina. Uh, yeah, I would, I would. Can I just ask a clarification yes, to make sure we're all on the same page? Is this to uh, the draft that would include the changes Dan reviewed? The That's what November I was just, 24th? Okay. I was just going to address. Thank you. Um, I, I would recommend that we amend the r original order 1015084 to include the uh, changes recommended by the town planner and that we have in our packet is Town of Scarborough, Hagen's Beach, Character Bay Zoning Districts. The final is of November 24th, 2015. I would recommend that we met, met, move that we amend it. Second. second that. Thank you. Second. Mm -hmm. uh, discussion on the amendment. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, um, I, I know I was on the Long Range Planning Committee that had put forward these plans for both this Higgins Beach and also um, to address Councilor St. Clair's that, yeah, we will we'll get this process at Pine Point, but and it will to be totally different, Pine Point, um, is um, I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into it, and I really appreciate the fact that um, Mr. Bacon went back and talked again, had some people who came forward with some more tweaking, if you will, that I think just makes it a better and stronger um, zoning. Um, ordinance for this area. So I, I will definitely uh, vote <coughs> to support this uh, as amended. So I, I, um, I think the changes are terrific and I just also wanted to um, uh, also say that I really appreciate the responsiveness of the, of the department. I know there's a lot of work went into this and I, I um, really appreciate how the, the process was so inclusive of the, the community feedback and I'm also going to support it. Councilor St. Clair. Thank you. Um, I also want to commend um, Dan and his entire group and the Higgins Beach group. Um, this wasn't something that has just happened overnight. They, this has been going on for quite some time, um, and it's a lengthy process. And, and I would say that most of the people that were involved in it that lived there really hung on through the entire thing. I mean, it's their community. It's very important to them. Um, you know, we sometimes get take a lot of flack for... Higgins Beach, Higgins Beach, Higgins Beach, but in this instance, this was the right place to start, and um, I strongly believe that. And like Dan has said, and I believe a lot of the other counselors have said, um, Higgins Beach is extremely unique, and so it was important for these changes to be made, and it was important for some of these things to become unified, and I, I just think it's going to make um, a world of difference down there. It's going to really streamline things, and I think you did a wonderful job, and I don't think you just. I don't think you just did your job. I think you went above your job. So thanks, Dan. I agree with that, <laughs> Councilor Bebon. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm fighting off a cold, so I'm going to be a little clogged up here. Um, you know, this is actually the second example in which I think the town has gotten zoning done um, absolutely wonderfully. The first was maybe it was last year or two years ago. I can't remember the exact timeline, but when we started really talking about the Dunstan Village redesign. Um, and we, you know, through SEDCO facilitated community meetings that talked about the zoning and what was included. <laughs> and here is our second example. And, you know, one of the, uh, as one of the people who said that this becomes almost a template for Pine Point, I hope that no one presumes that it's the ordinances itself that's the template, it's the process right. of involving the community and the process of how, having those public sessions. So uh, I really appreciate all the work that's been done. Thank you. Councillor Keza. Uh, I, I really just want to kind of mimic what Sean said. Um, I, I did meet with Dan, uh, Will and I, Council Rowan and I had the opportunity to meet with Dan and he explained uh, the process to us being first time counselors and I was very impressed with the amount of community involvement and I think it's a, it's a good testament to that, the fact that there, isn't a lot of, there aren't a lot of people here who are, are voicing concerns about it. I think they've had a good process to work through. I think it's looking at this from a new approach. I think it's, it's good for us to try this out. There's nothing in here that's, that's permanent forever. If we find some things are working and some things aren't, you know, Dan's going to uh, agree to go back and look at the process and review it. 
So I think it's a good, a good first attempt at some new zoning approaches. And again, I would uh, reiterate to the people in Pine Point, it's not so much that word for word, we're going to take this now and plop it into another community. I think we're, we're more concerned with mimicking that approach, that community involvement approach, the type of zoning that was, that's being presented here, and, and giving the opportunity for more input and more feedback from a community base. Other, other comments? Uh, ready for a vote. All in favor of this. this is the motion to amend. All in favor? Raise your hand. Opposed? The main mo uh, that's unanimous. Uh, the main motion uh, on order 15-084 as amended is now before us. Uh, any further discussion? Ready to vote, I can see. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, unanimous. Thank you. Uh, to make clear, the next two orders, which are related to the one that was just adopted, uh, uh, it was my intention to have the public hearing be all integrated for the three of them. But if anyone was confused, I want to give the, uh, anyone in the audience the opportunity uh, to speak at this time on either of the next two uh, orders. See none. Close that. Uh, and uh, let's take uh, orders separately for each. Uh, what's your pleasure? The, I move uh, order number 15085. Second. Thank you. Uh, this uh, uh, motion uh, is for the zoning map. Is there any further comment that anyone would like to make? No, thank you. All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, accept a motion on the third order. Okay, I move uh, approval. Sorry. Go, go ahead. right ahead, uh, Councilor Kerry. Move approval, order number 15-086. Second. Thank you. Uh, again, any further discussion or deliberation on this? Thank you. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, unanimous. Thank you. New business, uh, order number 15-094, first reading and refer to the planning board for a public hearing, the proposed amendment to chapter 405, the zoning ordinance of the town of Scarborough, Maine, section Roman numeral 18, town and village centers <coughs> district, subsection C, permitted uses, conventional and planned developments, residential uses. If uh, our town planner would, uh, Set the stage for this order. I would appreciate it. Thank you. This is a non-Higgins Beach related. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, this first reading proposal is the the title isn't that informative. It's a, it re, it's in regard to multifamily housing in the town's TVC district, and that's the TVC districts are basically the Oak Hill area and the Dunstan areas um, along Route One. And the town's been um, consistently now for five to ten years, really kind of looking at its zoning and trying to provide a wider range of housing choices, housing types, not just single-family neighborhoods, but also two-family and townhouse and multifamily type housing, and also housing that has different price points. Mm -hmm. um, and this is largely to respond and to changes in demographics, you know, aging, incomes, things of that nature. And so Scarborough's been pretty successful in, in, in doing that over the past handful of years. We have some new neighborhoods like uh, Dunstan Crossing Eastern Village that have a mix of housing. We have some new projects that are multifamily or, or um, townhouse style projects. So this amendment really kind of furthers that um, and it's along those lines. Currently in the TVC district, Multifamily housing is allowed, but it's limited in, how many, in terms of how many units can be in one multifamily building. Right now that limit is 12. So um, also in the zoning, in the TVC, multifamily buildings have other limits and constraints. They can be no greater than 10,000 square feet of building footprint, which is actually roughly the size of this building. Town Hall is roughly 10,000 square feet of footprint, the size of the um, the lot that it takes up, and the TVC limits multifamily and other 
housing and development to three stories or 45 feet. So Town Hall may be a good example in terms of what you can build in the TVC in terms of a residential building. Um, and so as we've had experience over the years with these regulations, we found that developers are quite comfortable with the building footprint and the height limitations. Um, and that's been effective to make sure buildings are in scale with what people kind of think of as Oak Hill and Dunstan. An area that has become a challenge is the 12 units per building limit because um, we're trying to, through the zoning, also allow smaller units, meaning one bedroom units versus three bedroom units, you know, smaller apartments um, for different size families, um, different residents. And so if you think of a 12 unit building with one bedroom units, that adds up into a much smaller building than a 12 unit building with say three bedrooms in each unit. Um, so that's become a, become a challenge for kind of creating those one bedroom uh, multifamily structures and creating, creating them in a cost-effective way. So the proposal that's before you is to uh, eliminate the limitation of 12 units per building um, so that applicants and developers can do, say, 16 or 20 units in a multifamily building. They'll probably they'll be smaller units than if they did, you know, 12 so that we could see more one-bedroom, two-bedroom um, type units. And in talking to the Long Range Planning Committee about it, which is the committee who reviewed this and rec recommends it to you, um, the Long Range Planning Committee felt quite confident that multifamily buildings still would be in scale with Oak Hill and Dunstan because the other standards remain in place. They're still going to be limited to three stories in height. They'll still be limited in terms of their square footage. Um, so that's the reason it's before you, to provide a bit more flexibility in terms of number of units that can go in a building. Um, perhaps a good example of uh, a project that didn't comply with this restriction and, and came to you and got special approval is the Avesta housing project. They went through a contract zone process just recently. Um, and it was supported by the council. And <coughs> one of the reasons they came to the council was they wanted to do mostly one bedrooms and they wanted to do more than 12 one bedroom in one in one structure. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's the proposal that's before you. The actual amendment's really simple. It just strikes the 12 units per building limit. So there's not much to the zone change, but I wanted to provide sort of the context behind uh, the proposal and, and why the Long Range Planning Committee is recommending it to you. If you'd remain there for a moment. Uh, sure. Questions by start at the end and we'll move this way. So, Dan, I apologize if this probably says so in the zoning or maybe it doesn't. Um, are there limitations or, or requirements on minimum square footages for units that say like a one bedroom has to be or can't exceed like 800 square feet or something? So is there a way to, is there another mechanism to check the number of units in, in a facility other than just the, the overall square footprint? Yeah, that's a great question. There is. Um, if you want to do a one bedroom unit and be counted in that way, then you also, that the overall living space of that one bedroom needs to be 750 square feet or less. So it can't be a one bedroom, but with 2,000 square feet and a bunch of rooms that look like bedrooms, but are right, you know, at building permit time labeled differently. So yeah, it needs to be designed to be an overall smaller unit. Correct. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Okay, Dan, just a quick question. As part of the planning process, do, do people look at parking and traffic flows and other things? Because I know both Dunstan and Oak Hill are becoming fairly congested. So by having more units, you obviously have more traffic and more. Is that part of the consideration or is that? There's been a lot of analysis done on the impacts of yeah. one bedroom versus two, three, four bedrooms. Yeah. Um, and. I don't have the statistics in front of me. I can provide them to the council before public hearing, but we have um, pretty good documentation that one bedrooms and two bedrooms are generally half the impacts of a three or four bedroom uh, in terms of traffic, in terms mm -hmm. of sewer generation, uh, wastewater, 
uh, in terms of parking needs, you know, all the various things that the planning board typically looks at. Um, and that informed kind of how the town has kind of treated density in, in that regard. And um, But I'm happy to give you more statistics on that so that the council can kind of look at that and, 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 th and think about it. Um, in terms of parking spaces in the zoning ordinance, one bedroom residential units are required to have one and a half parking spaces when um, two or more are required to have, have two parking spaces in terms of um, what the requirements might be. Other questions? How's our own? So these are, these are more kind of curiosities. I'm just trying yeah. to find out more about this. But I assume that some thought went into the original uh, limits. Do we have any kind of insight into what we were trying to, to do, <coughs> you know, prior to when we were limiting the number of dwellings? Yeah. When we changed the limits um, and established the 12 units per building limit, the town at that time, and that was maybe 2006 oh. or plus or minus, I think uh, Councilor Babine was involved. Um, Townwide, the most units per building allowed was eight, and that's kind of the upper end of what you typically see in sort of condominium type developments. Um, that not sort of apartment type housing. And 12 was a kind of what is the next step, what is a bit more that um, the community and the council at the time thought was reasonable to allow something more apartment style, but not kind of urban style apartments that wouldn't be in character with, with Scarborough. Uh, there was a concern at the time that if it wasn't limited, then there would be you know, uh, higher rise apartments or, or large apartment buildings that weren't in scale and in keeping with Oak Hill or Dunstan. Um, so there was kind of belt and suspenders. There was that 12 unit limit, but also the building footprint limit and the height limits and the other density limits. And so what we found is that those other limits work pretty well and aren't going to allow sort of large apartment buildings because they're, because um, of where they're set at and that instead we're kind of inhibiting the smaller units, more smaller units in one building. So. Gotcha. And that kind of leads into my next question was I, I noticed that um, in, the, in the amendment there's also a change to limit in the mixed use facility to cut that down to remove the eight dwelling limit. Mm -hmm. um, but we leave kind of another arbitrary limit in there which is the, the townhouses. I was wondering if you could speak to that. It seems to be the only arbitrary limit left in that particular yeah, yeah. Um, the Long Range Planning Committee talked about that a bit, but we, we certainly can talk about the townhouse limit more through this process. Um, the thinking was that, you know, townhouses are, you know, that's the kind of the vertical living where um, mm -hmm. you have common walls and people have two or three stories, and that there was there was a kind of desire to to li still limit them in some way because if you have a long row of townhouses that gets to be um, a lot of building horizontally. Um, and so that's something to, to think about, whether we want that to be a higher number. Um, I'm not sure. It's the eight units per townhouse has worked okay for Eastern Village and Dunstan Crossing. That's, they've been complying with that. But I know Elliot's here who has more experience than I in terms of townhouse construction. So maybe he'd want to comment on what he sees is sort of a, a, you know, kind of a, a reasonable limit, or if that should be, you know, looked at too, um, because long range planning committee didn't see that as the thrust of the changes, but we can we can certainly look at that. Other other questions, Councilor Caterina. Actually, this is more comment um, from again from the long range planning committee uh, point of view. One of the reasons that um, I personally wanted to see this. Um, come into being is it will allow for more affordable apartment houses. If any of you are familiar with articles in the Portland paper recently, and of course my business as a real, real estate broker, it's very hard finding affordable rentals uh, in this area. Um, and there's a real demand for one bedroom um, apartments, particularly from older people 
who may be downsizing, don't want to buy something, but don't want to go into, you know, a Bella Vita or, or you know, Piper Shores or whatever, uh, or for younger uh, workforce, um, um, people in the workforce who are just starting out in life also. So that was another driving force behind uh, this. So I just wanted to bring that up for the council. Uh, other questions of... Uh, Dan, uh, picking up on Councillor Hayes' question, mm -hmm. uh, impact is obviously always the concern of the neighborhood when you have a zoning change. Uh, and, and I think you answered quite well the parking uh, issue uh, so that the parking needs will still have to be met for whatever configuration results. Mm -hmm. Did you see any other uh, adverse risks of impact from this change? Uh, or did the Long Range Planning Committee identify any that uh, should be aired? Not through their deliberation. I don't want to no, speak for no, Gene Ray, no, but um, okay. I mean, I think it'll be. I'm not thinking of all the various components right now that we looked at some years ago as to mm -hmm. comparing a one bedroom to three and four. But I can provide that to you all to look at. It was it was parking. It was traffic generation. You know, mm -hmm. the amount of trips. Um, the number of residents, the amount of kind of utility needs, wastewater and water, and they all were kind of very well proportioned to be half or, you know, less of a house, like a single family house that might be three or four bedrooms. Um, and that really kind of informed the thinking around treating them differently. Um, but I think it's, I want to it to you so you can kind of look at the numbers and, and kind of scrutinize and understand it. Thank you. I think that yeah. would be appreciated mm -hmm. yeah. for the neighborhood to sure. understand a lack of increased impact. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll open this up to... Right, oh, sorry, just one more. Just one more. Councillor Kaiser. Yeah. Sorry, Dan, have you received any input at all from Oak Hill or Dunstan? I mean, I know this isn't the, it's not the redevelopment of a new zoning process. <coughs> Is there any neighborhood in, input in this other than... The, has anybody come forward and said, we really need to do this, or has it been more from the development or development for standpoint? We've heard more from the development community about, and from sort of the affordable housing mm. folks. Mm. Those have been the sectors that have talked about it in terms of um, wanting to mm -hmm. see the change and wanting some flexibility around it. Um, to, to kind of to zoom out a little bit and think about it, it's not necessarily allowing more density on the site because we're not changing how many we're not changing the residential density allowance how many units are allowed on particular property we're changing how they can be arranged so right now you can build the same number of units on the site you're just required to build two buildings that have say you want to build 24 one bedroom apartments you're building two buildings right now two 12 unit buildings two 12 smaller 12 unit buildings rather than being allowed to build one medium sized 24 unit building if you think about it that way so in terms of impacts and people it's not increasing the amount of residents that can go on a property it's how they're arranged right. um, and it's so for developers I think they care about the cost um, and they c it's cheaper to build a one 24 unit building than two 12 unit buildings and if it's in scale then the thinking so far has been that right. does that does that matter so much thank you thank you uh, we'll open this to public comment uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to address this please state your name and address please Elliot Chamberlain 8 Nottingham Drive I'm currently developing Dunson Crossing as Dan said uh, first, I want to thank Dan and the Long Range Planning Committee for addressing this issue. I think it's long overdue. Um, Dunstan Crossing has been around for about eight years now. Um, it all came about with the idea of creating uh, diversity in housing, different housing types, different housing sizes and prices. Um, I think we've gone a long way in uh, attracting uh, a multitude of groups of people within the same neighborhood which is what we were trying to accomplish and we've done that one area we have not been able to do that is in the rental side in the smaller uh, one bedroom as as Dan talked about most of the developers that are looking to do more units in one building it 
what they're trying to accomplish is the smaller units in more in one building. Yes, we could, we're not going to probably be able to get more units on the site in my particular site, which is the Route 1 side of Dunson Crossing, which we're hoping to uh, uh, open up sometime in 2016. Uh, we have a certain number of units we can do. So it all comes down to how many buildings it'll be in, how affordable we can create those units, and also obviously the less expensive we can create those units, the more affordable we can be to the renter. Um, if we are creating one-bedroom units, we're not attracting the kids. Um, we're talking about people. What we've seen as a big change in the last few years is a group of people that can afford to own their own home. They just choose not to. Um, we've always got the people that are not quite ready to financially step into a home, but now there's a big shift into uh, a large group of people are just choosing to be renters instead of homeowners. Um, after going through the downturn of 08 through 010, um, a lot of people have just decided renting can be a lot easier um, than owning a home. Um, if you take people, um, whether they're young or older, uh, a single person, all of a sudden, a 700, 750 square foot apartment uh, in the right area can become very appealing, especially if it's in within walking distance to certain services, uh, close to shopping, um, you're on public services. Um, so that gets back to, can we build them affordable enough so that it, it, if you can't build them affordable enough, that person isn't going to rent that. They're going to go somewhere else or they're ultimately going to buy. So this does what I think Easton Village and Dunstan Crossing did. It creates one more piece of diversity to the housing types in, in the town of Scarborough. So I think it's a great idea. Um, I think you should give it serious consideration. And, and if there's anything I can do, I'm more than willing to help. Thank you. Elliot, I wonder, do you have any opinion about the townhouse question? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I think when you're looking at a townhouse, most likely you're probably going after a two- or three-bedroom type buyer. Mm -hmm. Most likely it's probably more home ownership. Um, so me personally, the eight has worked great because I don't think I'd want to see a building three, four hundred feet long. Um, it gets difficult to do with grading issues and uh, our building in Dunstan when you first come in we have one on the left that's 200 feet long and one on the right that's 150. Uh, I think they're very well in scale but I think that was probably about as far as we'd yeah. probably want to go. I think it's a different bias so when you look at that different bias you're looking at a different building. Uh, when we're looking at the, the uh, 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 multi-unit building uh, which eliminates the 12, now we're changing buyers again. So you're looking at the structure differently. Um, so I, I don't think, at this point, from my standpoint, I don't think the aid is a problem. Thank you, Ellie. A pleasure of the council. Full approval. Second. <coughs> Discussion? Uh, Councillor St. Clair. I have to, uh, I would fully support this. I, this has been a huge thing for me for quite a while is um, affordable housing. I think there's nothing that drives me more crazy than the fact that we have people in this town that can't even afford to live here. I mean, we're talking about teachers and firefighters and police officers and people that work at Hannaford and, you know, all the things that people that work in this town hall, the, all the things that keep this town running. Um, and some of them don't have families and or they're just starting out with new families and um, I think it's just critical that we get some some more places for them to live or we're gonna turn into a town that I don't think we really want to be um, and go in a direction that we really don't want to go in so I would fully support that and mm -hmm. I also on the uh, to follow up on your um, point about the townhouses um, I've been in, I live off of Broad Turn and I've actually gone down into your neighborhood a, a couple of times to look at the townhouses and I would say that, you know, you, when you see the aid, it just seems to fit right and it looks right and um, it's very appealing. I can't imagine adding on um, more to that. It almost seems like it would have a topple over effect and I, that's obviously not what would happen, but when you're looking down at it, it's almost like, I don't know, it just seems... Um, not quite as eye appealing to me, and uh, the eight always just seemed to be a better number. But anyway, that's just my my very personal opinion. But I do have to say that um, it's very hard pressed for me to ever turn away 
um, affordable housing in this town. Councilor Um You know, I think on the surface that's that's obviously very important. We've 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 taken into a, uh, taken it on as a council to try and create as much affordable housing in town as we can. Uh, like anything else, I'd like to see the details. I'd like to see the map and see how it's impacted. I'd like to see the some of the numbers that Dan puts them forward in terms of density, in terms of of resource requirements and things like that. I'm sure it's going to flush out in the end, but before before I go headlong into making a full commitment, I think we need to see some of that data first, um, and then and then really kind of analyze it and see what kind of impacts we're looking at. Further comments? Uh, yes, Councilor. A hey, couple of uh, issues. Um, first is, um, uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Bacon and Mr. Hall, I swear I did not talk to uh, um, Mr. Rowan beforehand because you had the exactly same question <laughs> I had before. So, um, I'm great that it got all covered because I think the most important statement that was made is that this is um, not going to change density, but it's going to change how it's arranged. And that's how I think the public needs to um, receive this uh, information. Um, because of the other overlapping criteria, I think that um, Path initiatives and desires of the community um, will be maintained, especially as we start another comprehensive planning process to develop whether or not this is something we want to develop even further. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I wanted to bring some perspective on the history of, of um, kind of why this happened. And, you know, we, this community has grown pretty significantly, just what all of us have been here for a long amount of time. And, you know, back in 2005 and six, we were growing just astronomically. And I think that there was a you know, for lack of um, better words, there was an incredible concern about growth within the schools and being able to afford it um, and how we were going to manage that. And that's when growth management, smart growth, all these different terms came up. And we started looking at that. But yet last year, I thought it was telling, and it's actually a concept that um, I fully uh, believe in. Um, you know, Charles Kogan, who is the former state economist, said that in order for our communities to grow, after this last recession and through this recovery, we need to think outside the boxes that we created with our growth management ordinances. And uh, when we look at the uh, items such as this, I think that this is a positive step when you have the other criteria that kind of overshadow it or at least uh, umbrella that. Um, the, the other piece, and I can't read my own writing, so I apologize, is that um, as we look at these changes and change that box, I hope that we also kind of think about the next step because it changes the expectations of services in which the people that then come and rent those, um, those uh, pieces of property. Um, it impacts everything from school funding to community services to fire and public safety because as you change that demographic, the expectations of those people change and it, it has a really a um, um, kind of an ancillary effect on everything else that we do in the community. So, you know, I hope everyone keeps that in mind. Thank you. Other comments? Mm -hmm. All set? Uh, ready for a vote. Uh, all in favor of moving this for screening? All opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order number 15-95, uh, act on the recommendations for council chair liaison committee and board appointments. And we are going to distribute uh, copies. Uh, I will inform everyone that uh, I distributed these uh, previously just for the benefit of the counselors so that they would be able to see what uh, the assignments were. Um, and uh, pleasure of the council. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion. I'll start off. Okay. Looking Kaysen. forward to hitting the ground running. Let's let's get cranking. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Councilor uh, Katarina. Uh, I appreciate all the work that went into this with uh, Councilor Donovan, uh, excuse me, Chair Donovan, and his Vice Chair, um, Mr. Baybine. Um, it looks like there's been some good matches on different things. Uh, uh, as we discussed in our retreat to uh, today, you know, that matching people with the things they like to do or are good at doing mm -hmm. uh, is going to be really important for moving forward. Um, and I, too, am looking forward to a really good year and a productive year and getting some things done. Thank you. For the comments, Councilor Bevel. Um, I just want to make sure that the public, uh, since we're not going to read them into the record, that the public's going to have I think access. I will. Uh, I'll read the uh, standing committees. In oh, okay. Um, 
So outside of that, um, I want to make sure that at least they're available online for people to review. I just wanted to say thank you for the placements that I received. I'm very excited. There's actually, even though um, I constantly remind myself about the number of years, I've, there's some things that I'm doing this year I've never done, mm -hmm. and I'm really, really excited about that, such as uh, being the um, liaison to the library trustees. I'm really looking forward to that. It's a new assignment that I've never done. Um, but, you know, to Councillor um, Katarina's comments about um, our retreat and, and one of the items that we had here is related to this. So that is, I think that um, I hope that the chairman as well as others that um, if I am not, if I find I'm not well suited for something, um, I will come forward and kind of talk to you about it because I think that one of the things that we talked about was we need to be well suited for the committee work that we want to do because there's an expectation by the citizens that we show up and that we participate. And, so if I have any problems, I know I'll, I'll come to you, Bill, uh, to talk about that as well as to Tom if there's any issues. But uh, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about it. And I just wanted to uh, also express appreciation for the hard work that went into matching the, the assignments. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, uh, just so that people in the audience and at home will uh, understand what the uh, standing committee's assignments were, uh, for the Appointments Committee, uh, Councillor St. Clair is the chair. Councillors Cayuso and Rowan are, make up the rest of the composition of the committee. The Finance Committee was announced uh, at the last meeting. Councillor Babine is the chair. Councillors Hayes and Cayuso are uh, uh, the other sitting members, and I am sitting as an alternate. The Rules uh, and Policy Committee is chaired by Councillor Hayes. Uh, uh, along with Councillors Baybine and Rowan making up the rest of the committee. The Fair <coughs> Hearing Authority uh, uh, is uh, chaired by Councillor St. Clair with uh, myself and Councillor Katerina uh, making up the balance of the committee. Yeah. You didn't read the word, did it? Councillor Katerina is chairing the ordinance. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor St. Clair and Rowan are uh, the other members, uh, standing members of the committee, and I am sitting as an alternate. Uh, further comment on, on this matter? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Next order of business. Order number 1596. Uh, Act on the request to approve the new Town of Scarborough outside agency funding policy. What's the pleasure of the Council? Move approval. Second. Okay. And I will uh, ask the two fellow uh, committee members uh, to uh, speak first since they have the greatest insight into this. And why don't I start with Councilor Caterino and then I'll ask Councilor Hayes to. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Rules and policy met and discussed um, the whole concept of, you know, the town giving money um, to uh, so-called charitable uh, or nonprofit agencies, because uh, I know some people are concerned about, well, why should my tax dollars be going towards that, and I can give my own money if I want to, and, and whatnot. Uh, and we came up, we had, um, Mr. Coyne, Dan Coyne from the United Way met with us and talked to us at length about United Way and the uh, 211 calls that are, I, I guess you, United Way runs, so I'm looking at Peter Peters nodding him. <laughs> 211 calls that come in. And as a committee, we looked at, you know, the number of people from Scarborough who are calling the 211 for help um, and noticed trends in, in what people were requesting. So we've made a decision that we would like to continue doing uh, the outside agency funding. And, uh, and just for people who are concerned about us using so-called tax money for this, please understand that we're doing it because we're leveraging your tax money. We are leveraging the ability for us to provide services to our citizens in need in this town. And for every dollar we, we, we invest, in this program, we're getting a multiplier effect in return and, and value. And I know I was at um, a COG meeting, I think it was a COG meeting, I'm trying to remember what it was, but anyway, it was, it, it was uh, about six months ago um, with the other Cumberland County, a lot of the town managers were over there, and we were looking at 
uh, general assistance funding, and Scarborough has one of the lowest, if not the lowest, spending under general assistance. And of course, everyone's looking at me and going, what the heck, you guys just say no all the time or what? <laughs> Uh, but I explained to them, uh, first of all, how we have, you know, Project Grace in town and um, how we have this policy of investing uh, some taxpayer dollars uh, in order to leverage and meet the needs of people without having to go to the GA funds for that. So I'll throw it over to Thank you. <laughs> go for it. Um, I, guess, I guess the only, the, the sort of other conversations we had is we've looked historically at where we've given contributions. Um, some of them have been for agencies and things that are outside the town of Scarborough. So some other criteria we're thinking about, as Jean Marie had shared, we're going to take a look at the 211, 211 calls to figure out what are the needs in the community and then try to ask agencies that are based here in Scarborough, so the dollars actually that are coming in we're keeping here in town, what would be their specific sort of proposal to address those needs? And then in one thing we haven't done in the past, is then also to set up some type of accountability. So if they'll come to us, give us a proposal on what they're going to do, and have a feedback loop so that we can look back to see, okay, this is this is where the funds went and this is how they were used. So it's a little different process, but it was really focused on trying to keep the Scarborough dollars here in Scarborough to agencies here in Scarborough that are, that are addressing some of the needs that have been identified. Thank you. Uh, uh, other comments? Uh, I will say that I was not familiar with 211. I mean, everyone knows what 911 is and uh, 411, but 211 was new to me. Uh, we had uh, uh, a suggestion by Councilor Hayes that we contact the United Way, Greater Portland United Way, uh, that we get the benefit of their insight uh, into making allocation decisions. Dan Coyne is a, uh, a representative from Greater Portland United Way who resides in Scarborough. Very much appreciated being made a part of our process at the uh, uh, rules committee level. Uh, that resulted in us looking at <clears throat> 211 data that told us this is really uh, where the needs are. Uh, and we're talking about very fundamental needs. We're talking about providing heat when people don't have heat and can't afford heat in the winter. Uh, food, clothing, shelter. Uh, they're these are very basic essential requirements and the three of us sitting as the committee believed that this was the sort of focus that this community would support. And so that's uh, 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 really how this came about uh, and I uh, would uh, uh, I appreciate seeing the Project Grace Executive Director, Steffi Cox, in the audience tonight, interested in uh, enough to, to be present. Uh, uh, and they do, as we all know, a wonderful job. So uh, I think this uh, uh, matter is now up for public comment. Seeing none, close. Uh, further comment? Uh, Councilor Bailey. So I just have one question um, regarding the process for determining awards. Um, if I read the way that I'm reading this, and it's not a criticism of our manager by any means, is that the manager has full discretion to the agencies in which will be funded because of the way that this is worded. Even though we may approve the budgetary impact, we would not go through the, any uh, formal process at either finance committee or any other committee level to determine who we're going to fund and what we're going to fund. Is that correct? That was done by design, not that I'm no, I know. hungry. Uh, <laughs> it's really to relieve you of that age, uh, annual <laughs> dilemma that you find in yourself. So, so I guess the question I have is, um, and I, you, know, and I, you know, from the Rules and Policies Committee um, people as well as the town manager, and is this the fairest way that we can approach this so that there is never any question of bias or favoritism or whatever it might be? Um, you know, that we're above a reproach when it comes to criticism of any type of award. I, I, I don't yeah, think anybody's, com anybody's comment is. I, and let, let me read for the benefit of uh, those who uh, have not got this in front of them. The process for determining the awards uh, uh, is that the town manager shall present recommendations to the town council in conjunction with the submission of a proposed budget. Approval shall occur through the budget approval process. 
In presenting recommendations, it is within the discretion of the town manager to give such weight as the town manager deems appropriate to the program eligibility criteria. And I think the intention was to have this uh, be a somewhat streamlined process uh, that would still run through the Finance Committee uh, and be reviewed there to the extent that the Finance Committee deemed it appropriate uh, and then pass along as it does with its budget a recommendation to the Town Council. Other comments? Councilor Kazo. So I, I do think as a, as a town we have a fundamental responsibility to take care of the citizens of the town of Scarborough and that presents itself in many forms. Um, I know from my time on the school board the numbers showing that there, there are struggling families in Scarborough are there. It may not be as prevalent as some of the surrounding communities, but that doesn't diminish the needs of those people. Um, a couple of questions that I would have is if, if there are organizations outside of Scarborough that are providing services and benefits to the people of our town, how do we determine whether that's a good investment? Because from what I, if I understand this correctly, it, 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 this restricts us from also providing funding towards those organizations as well. So my, my question would be, you know, it's, I, I fully concur with the need <coughs> to manage our resources properly. I guess I would like to see something built into it to really be able to assess the needs of the community and if there's an outside organization that services those needs effectively and cost effectively and something that we as a council agree that it's in our best interest to do that, that that, that option is there as well. So I don't know how we can incorporate that. I just, reading this, it seems like it, it limits us to only organizations within Scarborough. And I understand the purpose behind that. Um, I just want to make sure if, if there is some, another group outside, how do we find a way to incorporate that? And, and, I, and I think we uh, were intentionally erring on the side of being respectful of the fact that these are tax dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a very limited amount of money. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to be able to make sure that we were able to leverage it for Scarborough residents to the greatest extent. <coughs> Other comments? Councillor Rowan. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, I appreciate the thought that went into, uh, went into this. I think that there are, um, you know, when we're talking about this type of service delivery, I think some outside agencies are better suited than municipal government to, to deliver some of these needs. I had the same reading as, as, and concern as, as uh, Councillor Chiazzo, um in that, you know, it seems like we're limiting ourselves based on a, a post office address. If, the, if someone is, is delivering services to residents in Scarborough, it seems like it'd be nice to be able to, to still contribute that money. Um, and then the other question, I had a question in there was, um, ha have we looked into or, or tried to actually quantify how much we'd be saving in general assistance dollars through the giving? I mean, it, it seems like there, there might be a way to to at least estimate kind of kind of the either the cost savings or you know the, the return on the dollars that we're investing in these things. It's worth worth evaluating. Maybe maybe we can develop a better understanding of mm -hmm. the leveraging effect. Yeah, there might be a way to, to see the, the the decrease in the, the request and the other comments. Um, and I, I, I think the, uh, the comment made about are we being unduly restrictive in requiring Scarborough-based uh, entities uh, 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 may be subject to a review at second reading uh, because certainly uh, the language uh, 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 for program eligibility uh, could strike uh, that that says Scarborough-based. And, and read requests will only be considered from agencies uh, who provide the majority of their services to Scarborough residents. That would be an option. Just, uh, to, just to point out, there is no second reading. This is a, right. an right. order and once it's it done. So okay. if you wish to amend, it tonight would be tonight or to table the matter. And, and I think the, uh, the intention is to see how it works. As in the senior property tax relief, uh, I don't think we should be afraid to get this right over time but that there is, uh, I think, a need to, uh, to put something in place. Uh, and so I think it would be my recommendation to go with what we've got. Let's see how it works for a year. Uh, and if it's uh, not completely meeting the needs of the community, then I would be very open to uh, uh, further amendments. Councilor Kazan. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, 
I, I, I think that's that's fair. My concern is is if if needs aren't met, um, you know, it's easy for us to delay a year. But if there are some some real fundamental needs that are out there that aren't being met, um, how are we as a council going to know that? Are, are we going to get you know? Our, I don't know what our general assistance requests are, or you know how we see that as a council. I'm not familiar with that process. So it'd be difficult for me to gauge as an individual whether this process is working because I don't know what we're measuring. We're, are we measuring the number of people that we're trying to help or are we measuring the amount of money that we're saving or are we measuring how we're allocating our resources? So I, I, I'll support it for the reason that we do need to move. I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's something, it's a good start, but I would like to see a little bit more analysis, if you will, eventually and, and find a way to, to get a check back to say, are we really doing the right are our resources really going to the right place or are we missing the mark somewhere? Yeah, if I could offer, I think the real backstop for folks, if, if there's a concern that there will be folks that are in need that aren't receiving services, so long as they're eligible, we must provide general assistance so long as they right. apply. That's right. mm -hmm. So uh, there's always that backstop that's available. Again, people need to be eligible and avail of themselves of that system. Yeah. Um, I suspect the barometer will be uh, higher GA spending for us in the year. Uh, would be probably the, what we'd see if, if, by virtue of this policy change, um, folks aren't getting services somewhere else. Right. They're likely to come back to us. Right, and, and oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Kettering. And if we uh, could keep in mind that there are a number of people who fall through the cracks, they aren't really covered. GA, they uh, they don't quite fit in there, but yet they need help. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some way to fill that gap for them. So. Councilor Baybine. Yeah, um, maybe on the evaluation side, um, so um, not to be uh, too critical, um, if you ask um, what someone needs, you're going to have a request for something that you can't afford um, because there's always more need out there than what we can afford. Um, and we've run into that in many years, and it's very hard, so there's always going to be that situation of, you know, where do you draw the line in the sand and can you move it? What I would like to see maybe in this year, I, I agree, I, I think I can move forward with uh, you know, one year evaluation and see how it works. What I would like to see is, because I don't know, is what services are covered under general assistance for, um, for assistance, you know, as far as monetary assistance, and what are the groups that we're providing funding for? Because I think that, if I remember the list, there's going to be more services that general assistance doesn't cover that these charitable contributions yes. cover. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's really, there, while well, there's going to be some connection there, particularly around heating maybe and a few other things, um, there's a lot of things that aren't going to be covered. Um, so I would maybe as part of that evaluation, if we can just kind of have that comparison um, from a narrative perspective. I don't need quanti quanti you know, no, quantifiable think, data. I'm just looking for the narrative. I think the town manager would be, be able good. to provide us with a report that would uh, give us some insights on where general assistance misses the mark. Because uh, I need general assistance to pay my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, further, <laughs> further comment, Councillor St. Clair. Um, is there any way to possibly, um, because this is just a yay or a nay, is there any way to add in there that this is so that we're held accountable that this is reevaluated in a year? Because that writing, that language isn't in there. No, but I think by directing the it seems like as if the consensus of the town council is that we would want the town manager to provide us with that report. But I think the writing needs to be in there so that, because by the time, this time next year, we're, we could potentially have a different council. It certainly would not be inappropriate. This is a council policy to add, you know, this policy shall be reviewed annually. Yeah. yeah. There is an annual evaluation. Oh, not that's, for, that's for the awards. Yeah. Yeah. So, to do uh, so, an amendment would be. In I order, think right? we'd so like to have an amendment that would add uh, an annual review process uh, required. That's enough. So, okay. do you want me to put it in the form of an amendment? Uh, it would be a motion to amend, yes. Right. So, do you want me to put it? If you would. Okay. So, I'd like to, in the form of an amendment, to add that uh, the town manager or the council reviews this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think on the fly. Uh, this, this, this funding policy. Um, in a year, and that I don't think that doesn't mean that even at the year, say we get to the year and that year went great, that we can drop that line if things are going wonderfully. But I think we need to have. I think it doesn't mean it has to be every year, but let's get the year in there. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think the language that you're suggesting is 
yeah. appropriate, and uh, this policy shall be renewed annually. Thank you. Perfect. I would second that, her motion. Thank second you. Second motion. Uh, uh, motion to amend is on the table for discussion. Any further discussion? Mm. See none. All in favor? Uh, motion, uh, main motion as amended. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, non action items, uh, none at this time. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Why don't we start at the north end? Uh, I have no report. The school board, I believe, meets tomorrow, so I'm hoping to have a report at the next at the next meeting. Councilor Hayes. Uh, nothing to report this time. No, no, no meetings Thank yet you. between this and last time. So. Councilor St. Clair. Nope. Uh, Councilor Katerina. No. I have none. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to report, sir. Nothing. Uh, oh God, please. Uh, the one, uh, no, I don't have anything on uh, on uh, committee reports. Um, town manager's report. Thank you. Just a couple of items. Um, some late breaking news. I just, uh, following the retreat, I, I just quickly glanced at my emails. Unfortunately, Vesta Housing did not make the grade for funding this is for oh. Southgate. Uh, interestingly enough, they lost eight points, which is a huge amount in the scoring system. For not having a sidewalk in front of them, there was what? 200 feet of the existing sidewalk on Payne it's Road. Right there. Um, that's the response. I'll I'll know more tomorrow when uh -huh. I talk to them. Mm. Uh, they're not deterred. There's a second uh, source and round of funding that they'll be applying for um, early in the new year, and they're certainly committed to the project. So they still seem supremely confident that the, it will get built as as conceived. Uh, unfortunately, it just didn't happen this funding cycle. Uh, I'll just remind folks, uh, kind of on the lighter side, uh, Santa will be in the park, Municipal uh, Memorial Park, uh, this Saturday, December 15th, excuse me, December 5th, uh, starting at 5, and there'll be all sorts of wagon rides, uh, there'll be uh, hot chocolate and other concessions down in the uh, concession stand. So do please come out and enjoy that event. And I just want to really congratulate the council for taking the step they did today. Um, I've been doing this for about 23 years, and this is the only, only the second time that I've had uh, elected officials be willing to commit a good block of time uh, to be open and honest with each other, and I think it's just very, very encouraging for me to be part of uh, what I think will be a very successful year. So I congratulate you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor comments, we'll start with Councilor Ava. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone uh, for this afternoon's um, workshop and retreat. I thought it was an insightful uh, process. Um, kind of like uh, what uh, Town Manager Hall just said, uh, I've been on the council and school board since 2000, and this is only the second time I've been able to engage in this type of a workshop and retreat um, between, you know, as far as uh, on either board. And um, both times, um, or I should say the first time was highly successful, and I know that this time will be just as successful, so I'm really excited about that. I'm very excited about the point, um, about all of our appointments. I think it's going to be a very productive and very energized year. And um, it's um, almost ready to snow, so I hope everyone has adopted a fire hydrant in their neighborhood and keeps it clear for our fire department. Councilor Rowley. Um, I, I want to take the opportunity to um, thank the Murphy family. Uh, Kelly Murphy's on the school board, uh, and she collected food. Um, to stuff in backpacks over the, the Thanksgiving break uh, to send home with individuals that are um, on free and reduced lunch so that there would be uh, a met need over the, the extended break. And she does that every every break. And so I just wanted to, to make some public uh, acknowledgement of that and encourage you to reach out to Kelly um, before Christmas because that's a much longer break. Um, uh, I also want to express my appreciation to the um, Officer Gill and uh, Chief uh, Molten of the police department for including me in the Operation Hope uh, presentation, which occurred a couple weeks ago. I thought that was really powerful uh, and really uh, illustrated a need in the community. Um, and I appreciate everyone who came and was involved. Um, I also wanted to make an announcement that um, uh, Councillor Chiazzo and I, during our campaign, we made ourselves available for coffee uh, weekly. Uh, we're going to try and do that 
um, continue to do that now that we've been elected. Um, and the first one will be, and, but not weekly. Um, the first one will be this sun, this Sunday at, at 11 o'clock at Scarborough Grounds. Everyone's welcome. We're making announcements so counselors can come by as well. Um, the um, uh, this one may be a little bit. Of free. <laughs> 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 I'm, announcing, I'm announcing it publicly, right? You can come, but I'm, I'm not buying coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you can come, but you have to buy your own coffee. Yeah, we uh, can't. <laughs> you can't <laughs> you have to be silent. Um, the uh, this one might be a little bit abbreviated. There's a a birthday party that I may have to to uh, ditch you to go to go through quickly. Um, I also wanted to got a tour of the public safety building as well as public works, and I wanted to thank the um, the folks that uh, at, from both departments, or all, all three departments really, it was fire, police, and then uh, public works, and then uh, express my appreciation to uh, uh, Chairman Donovan and uh, uh, Tom for the uh, retreat that we just had. I thought that was really well run and well organized, and I think it's going to bear fruit. Me, I guess. <laughs> um, I also um, want to thank all my fellow counselors for the great retreat that we had. I, f I found it very fruitful. And it, as always, when you sit and you're in a different environment and you actually talk to one another, it's, it, I think it's helpful. You learn a lot. And I'm looking forward to continuing the good tone over the course of the year. Um, Tom already told you about Santa in the tree at 5 o'clock on Saturday. I would um, encourage any of my counselors that if you're available to come, it's fun to see the kids. I get so excited, you know, mm -hmm. waiting for Santa and whatnot. And they have, it's supposed to be warm too. I think it's supposed to be 50 degrees on uh, Saturday. So it's going to be a warmer event than it has been in the past. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Scarborough Kindness Project. Um, I went to their initial meeting, which was, I forget when, last week, time just flies. There were about, I'd say, 40 people who came um, from all different forms of, you know, older people, younger people. We had high school kids. We had a number of people there. And it was great to just talk about, you know, is this something that the town of Scarborough wants to adopt? And, and what should be the form of it. So I look forward to that. They do have a Facebook page if you're interested. It's called the Scarborough Kindness Project. So if you're on Facebook, um, get on and find out what's up. Uh, Project Grace, since Steffi's sitting in the back row. I have down here, don't forget the fuel fund. Even though it's warmer and oil prices are lower, there's still a huge need out there uh, for people in our community. Don't, I, I, if I'd gotten here earlier, I would have gotten some trash bags and handed them out. Not the trash bags, recycling, I should say. Um, remember, you can get the recycling bags at the town clerk's office. It's really easy to do. You just put your bottles in there and bring them back to shop and save. Oh, not shop. Listen to me. Hannah first. <laughs> uh, it's the clink, the clink program, and they take them and they automatically credit them to the fuel fund. Also, Project Hope, uh, I also went to that meeting that um, Chief Moulton and Office, Officer Gill, um, that they did, and we had some people there. We had uh, the Public Safety Commissioner from the Governor's Office. Regretfully, he didn't stay for the whole event. I'm just doing an eye roll, but that's, anyway. Um, and we had... Um, some state representatives, some state senators. So we had some people who wanted to know more about this program. For those of you who aren't aware, I don't know what, um, the police department here in town uh, helps people with uh, addiction issues, particularly opiate addictions. You can walk into the police station and turn in your equipment, turn in and ask for help, and you won't be arrested. Uh, and it's been wildly popular. I forget, 50 some odd people, mm -hmm. I forget the exact number, and I have, a, do you know how much mm -hmm. today? Yeah, around 60. Over 60, which is amazing. Uh, and they've been able to find placements for just about all of them, which is amazing considering that Maine, we really need to do more, and this is my, I'm going to be on my soapbox here, for treatment for people. Yes, we need to, you know, law enforcement, yeah, we got to beef that up, I agree. But treatment's the key. As I've always said, addiction is a disease. It's not a crime. So I'm very proud of uh, what the uh, police department is doing. 
And if you want to help with that, Project Grace happens to be the fiduciary for that. And you can donate money and go on to the Project Grace and donate money because they need money desperately for airfare because they end up sending a lot of these folks to treatment out of state. And I'm not just talking about out of state like New Hampshire. Florida. I'm talking about California, Florida, um, just far, far, far away. So um, anything that people can do um, would be marvelous. And for those of you who already have all the Christmas presents you ever wanted in your life, and you don't need anything new, ask your family to make donations to Project Grace or Project Hope or whatever for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever you celebrate. So that's it for me. Thank you. Councillor St. Clair. Uh, the only thing I would piggyback on, um, Councillor Katarina pretty much covered it all. Um, I just luckily happen to be um, very close friends with one of the Great. people that's spearheading Operation Hope and um, <coughs> so I've been able to sort of kind of get even a more personal perspective of it and it's just um, have to really um, it's sad to me that the majority of these people I would say 85 percent of them are sent to treatment outside of the state of Maine because we don't have the, the facilities for them uh, we don't have the money for them, which seems right. crazy that it costs us more. It costs us so much to send these people outside of the state, yet the state, we don't have the money to send them to our own state. So basically we've run out of beds. And so that's why we had to have a, um, a temporary shutdown of sending people out because we don't have the beds. Um, but luckily Project Grace, thank thankfully, has stepped up and been able to um, help them facilitate how to fundraise. And um, there's a button on Project Grace's page where you can go and, and donate money. And, and they're, they're, they're desperate for money. I mean, some, some people, um, I run a nonprofit, and some people think that $5 doesn't add up, but it does quickly. Um, so uh, even if it is $5, it, you, have, you have no idea what that money is going to go towards and it could really make an impact on someone's life. And, and it, we call it that trickle-down effect. Well, if these are addicts in the state of Maine, they, they are they're adding to our life and our livelihood and our children's lives and, and the whole state. So they need help, and it is an illness. Addiction is an illness. These people are not choosing to live their lives this way, and I bet you could talk to 95, 99% of every addict, and they would beg you mm -hmm. to say that this is not the way that they want to live their life. So I just um, wanted to just make that plea and, and thank them and thank Councillor Katarina for um, stepping up and being able to attend those meetings. And those police officers are going in. Um, I know my girlfriend was called in Sunday morning, 6.30 in the morning, on her day off. She had one day off last week, and she went in on a, on a Sunday morning just to try to help someone get through the day. Um, and they're doing it. They don't want recognition. They're not, right. they're, not, they're not posting on their page how they're doing all that extra stuff because they don't want it. They're not doing it for the pats on the back. They're doing it because they firmly believe that they're making a difference. And that's the true test of, of someone who has... Um, real kindness in their heart is when they do it for, not for recognition, but for the um, wanting to really help someone. So I'm really, prou I'm really proud of them. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I guess I'll kind of echo others. One, just thanking all my fellow counselors for investing the time today and trying to create a different environment, a different start. That's great. And two, I will also, I mean, a bunch of us did a, a, attend the Operation Hope, and we've talked about a lot of the different aspects, but there are times in life when things can really, really shine through or just really be very impactful. And what we didn't talk about during that, that process, they actually had three recovering addicts that spoke. Mm. And it was a very powerful, you can read about it, you can hear about it, but to help have the three of them share their stories about what they went through. And if you looked at them, they looked like you and I. They they were, you know, so it, it was, for me, it was just really impactful about making it come alive, what this is really all about. So it's a great program. We all should be proud. Kudos to the police department and others that are doing it. But that was very impactful for me. Councilor Kaiza. Well, bringing up the, the, the end comments, and everybody wants to get out of here, so I'll keep them brief. Um, I do want to thank uh, Chairman Donovan for the uh, committee assignments. I think... Um, I think even before we had our retreat today, I think there was a lot of thought put into it, and I certainly appreciate that. I think uh, I think we're well poised uh, across the board to be successful. Um, 
I did want to thank my fellow counselors for the effort today. Um, I know three hours is, is a long time. I wish we had some more time. I think it was a great process, and um, I think the, the people of Scarborough are going to see the outcome of that fairly soon. Um, and I think if we continue to stay committed and focused to it, I think we'll, we'll also be able to achieve a lot of stuff. So I'm looking forward to continuing that. Um, to Will's point, yes, uh, coffee um, Sunday at 11 a.m. Uh, I will not buy any of the counselors' coffee. Sorry. <laughs> or, 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 or talk to you. you the third one, I can't talk to you. You can sit in the corner and watch, but you know, I'm sorry, we, we can't we can't interface at that level. But um, <clears throat> but yes, I, 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 we'd love to have people come out and um, you know, it's it's just another opportunity, hopefully one of several, to to express your concerns, your comments, questions. And, uh, you know, honestly, if you feel like walking by and saying, hey, guys, great job, we'd love to pass that on, too. So um, please come down and say, at least say hi. Um, and uh, certainly we'll be available for, for a little while anyway. I won't keep Will from his, from his birthday uh, party. Um, mm -hmm. with, with, with Will, uh, I also met with uh, Chief Moulton, Chief Thurlow, and Mike Shaw. Um, we really have some top-notch people in our town um, running the departments that they're running. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always, um, I don't want to say surprising, but it's always eye-opening when you get behind the curtain and you start looking at the nuances and what people are doing with the resources that they have. Uh, it's, uh, <coughs> citizens of Scarborough should be very pleased with the, the efficiency and frugality that's being practiced across the board there. Um, Along those lines, I did just want to point out, we did discuss with Chief Moulton part of the, of the, uh, um, the, the project, uh, not the Project Grace things, but part of the Project Hope aspects of it. Um, and I wanted to reiterate, he was very clear with us that, that if I could plead to a different side of, of appeal for funding, there's no town funds being used for this process at all. It's all private funding, all contributions. Um, and the, his, he really hit the home point home for me, and I'm not sure for Council Rowan, I would sure I would imagine, you know, the, if you think it's not Scarborough's problem, mm -hmm. it's, yes. it's, that's not the case at all. The face of addiction is really um, widespread, and there's not the stereotypical homeless person sitting on a corner who's down and out. There's a very wide range of people that this impact impacts in our community <coughs> and also indirectly in our community. People are coming here and committing crimes in our community that we're being forced to deal with. So contributions aren't, it's not just a, you know, hey, we'd really like to some help. I think this is a really great investment in, in the community. Um, they need to, uh, certainly police people need to be commended for their tireless efforts and, and you know, again, it's something that really benefits the town without putting dollar values and dollar resources behind it. So um, that's it, and that's all I have for now. Uh, I'll be short. Uh, the uh, meeting we had was uh, very good. It's a, a great start. Uh, 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 I know that uh, the Project HOPE program continues to, uh, and we, we talked about modeling behavior and that we as a council in our deliberations and, and the way we treat each other <coughs> and the kinds of programs we support are the sorts of things we want the communities to say, that's the kind of community I want to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we aspire for that uh, for this year. Uh, uh, I know that I read in the Portland Press Herald that now the city of Portland is mm -hmm. doing their own yeah. uh, pro Project Hope style program. So that, again, if it hadn't been done in Scarborough, I doubt that any of these programs would have been initiated. So it's, great, it's a great uh, example to all of us. Um, as far as Scarborough Grounds is concerned, I <laughs> think it has turned into the most frequented uh, meeting room <laughs> in all of Scarborough. Uh, I was flicking through the New Yorker uh, today and I saw a cartoon at the coffee shop where the lady behind the counter said, no, the coffee's free. Now we're renting the tables. <laughs> 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 with pictures of everyone with laptops. So, uh, with that, I ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.